excited to have Jono Sosaska from Aquia. Um, he will be our host today, and Josh Holmes from Secure IO as a facilitator. So without further ado, um, Josh, do you want to take mm -hmm. it away? Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Shannon. So uh, yeah, we're really excited uh, to bring this to you today. Really excited to hear Jono and what he has to say in, in threat versus uh, mitigation. And you know, the last couple of weeks, I've, I've had a few meetings with Jono, got to know him. And you know he's a, he's a principal security engineer at uh, Aquia, and uh, you know it's being a veteran myself, found this company pretty cool. Also, part of the reason why I'm really excited to hear his in-depth knowledge because you know the the company that he works with it's a a leading cybersecurity industry distinguished as a service disabled veteran owned small business, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, they do a lot of forward thinking ideas and cutting edge solutions, such as like DevSecOps, cloud security, AppSec, purple teaming, software supply chain and security. So he has a very extensive background in a lot of different areas and really excited to see what uh, he's going to bring over this next uh, hour. And uh, so uh, let's go ahead and jump into the agenda and we'll just go over kind of a uh, few of the areas, so our goal, exchange real world experience, share practical knowledge, uh, validate ideas to improve our own practice. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules. So participants are free to use the information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any other participant may be revealed. Uh, video is optional, but highly recommended. And we kind of have a, a brief kind of time breakdown. Uh, so we'll go through the presentation then we will open it up for some question and answer discussion. Uh, so, uh, you know, feel free to post those questions or things you might have in the chat, but we will open it up later on after uh, to get a little bit more in depth and then we'll do a photo. Uh, so part of the video area as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand over to uh, Jono. Uh, so go ahead and take it away. Really excited. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jono. It's like Bono, but with a J. I appreciate the wonderful introduction, so I'm not going to spend too long here. Uh, but one of the things that I'd like to point out about my experience is that I've spent a little bit of time in what, in what I'd like to believe is almost all aspects of the software delivery lifecycle. Uh, I most recently, before my time at Acquire, uh, have been working as a community technical manager and developer advocate at HashiCorp. And part of my experience during that time was working with the product team to help be the voice of the customer when it came to how products were delivered in addition to the voice of the people doing research and development, the existing products and the lead engineering folk there. And as part of those experiences that I then took into consulting, the question and comments around prioritization uh, were something that always stuck out to me. And so that's one of the reasons why I chose a contentious topic today, uh, threat versus mitigation, what we're going to prioritize and how. So with that in mind, let's uh, just go into a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, first, I want to open up with what is priority. Uh, I'd like to think that we all have ideas around priority, but we're going to talk about some nuances that really drive how we can apply this type of concept in our threat modeling, which takes me to the next part where we're going to look at this relationship between threats, mitigations, applications, and how they drive or or use priority as a guideline to drive iteration and, and uh, opportunity. We're going to talk about uh, two major components that then protect priority. The first is going to be about executive buy-in you know, talking about what does it take to help make an environment where prioritization can be successful, especially when threat modeling is a practice in there. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about tools versus toil. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and kick it off. So what is priority? Uh, when doing research around priority and trying to find a definition, it's interesting because there's a lot of different definitions, but the one that I found was the most succinct is the first one where priority defines what merits attention before competing alternatives. And part of this definition that's really impactful here for me is the fact that there will always be competing alternatives. And so when you take into account the process of prioritization, which is trying to create a list and then organize the list by uh, the importance relative to each other, that second definition, 
there's certain things that help enable you to be a little bit more impactful. And that leads you to this concept of triage. In medicine, when you're talking about specifically trauma or EMT, there's a couple of different ways where individuals can go through and uh, respond to trauma situations. But the main core functionality is you're taking the individuals who have uh, a knowledge and understanding of the resources, the priorities, the people, the time, and can organize a solution and implementation. And so what I found in my discussions of priority is that triage is a little bit closer to the process that we're doing. And when we look at it in that way, we, we start to change some perspectives about the conversations of priority. So as a recap, priority is a relative concept to the people discussing it. The more people you have or the different varied roles represented by the people you have there, the more mutable and highly subjective it can be. That said, it doesn't mean that you should just say, oh, well, priority is always going to be relative. I'm not going to do it. In fact, it's the opposite. Priority is a practice. The more often we spend sitting there uh, trying to understand how to define, implement, and protect priority, the better we get at having these conversations around priority. Last but not least, and I said this in previously, we're talking about limited resources. And in software development, we're either talking about time or people, uh, and in most of the case, people's time as well, too. We have different sets of knowledge, sometimes can be limited by either access or our own experience that we have to take into account for prioritization. And when we're looking at prioritization, the who of who benefits can change often. So I, I went and actually started pulling some different organizations and tried getting some information about how they define priority. And in my discussions with them, we came to a, a couple of different core things that tend to drive prioritization. Now, I included some subsections here, but the core things that I want to take away are these four themes, where a company has a responsibility to drive value, value for the shareholders, value for the customers, value for uh, the people who have to run the application. They have to... Uh, prioritize the ability to protect data. In threat modeling, that's one of the, the core focuses is how do we identify data and protect it and interact with it in a way that, so the third point, allows us to experiment quickly and securely. Last but not least, we all have compliance requirements. For some developers, they may be more loose if you're in an unregulated field or in an environment that doesn't have uh, these data requirements. But that doesn't change the fact that eventually there's going to be some sort of compliance or auditing that has to happen. If we go back to this concept of triage, all of these are competing priorities. Every business has to deal with this, whether they're a software business or something else that just uses or consumes software. So how do we define what is more important? If I'm in, let's say, a solely security role or a SOC or being a data analyst for a SOC, I may value protecting data higher than driving customer value. Or I may say that protecting data is a higher priority because that is the way I can directly drive value. But that's relative to my role. Likewise, if I'm a developer, especially a developer who may not be used to working in a highly regulated environment, that ability to experiment may be more valuable in our prioritization because we're a greenfield app or because we need to reinvent the legacy system. So one of the things we're talking about today is prioritization. I hope that we've gone through and covered at least one of the questions, which is, how does my organization decide on priority? And I think a lot of folks have a good idea of this, but go through and confirm that, and then go through and confirm it with your team, and then compare and contrast how your team responds, even internally, against what your business responds or your compliance responds. Because those differences in perspective of those lenses are going to give us an understanding of what the priority of our organization is and how we're going to respond to it. So let's dig into priority a little bit more here. Um, priority can be affected by three sets of things. Uh, when we were talking about triage, one of the things that we identified is resources. And these two points here that are impacts are, are around resource contention. One, depending on the size of the organization, 
your availability of resources, but your uh, ability to have single threaded resources are going to vary wildly. If I'm in an under 100 organization that's in a startup, uh, the amount of people that I can tap for resources, especially for complicated or in-depth technical projects is way less than larger organizations. But am I able to move faster? Does that provide me the ability to say I have less to triage and can focus more on the prioritization? This is something that we're going to have as part of our discussion questions, which is for larger organizations, how do you all go through and prioritize? That's something that we want to dig into more. So I figured I'd drop the question early so you can think about it. Next, uh, one of the things that I actually didn't consider until I had an opportunity to talk with Josh is in talking about limited resources, one of the things that we can be limited by, especially in a world of SaaS and COTS products, is that the ability to access the source code, the understanding of what the state of the code is at any given point in time, as a limited resource affects us. And that can affect prioritization as well, too. We're going to talk about this a little bit more in the executive buy-in and protecting of vendor relationships. But as a limited resource, do we allow ourselves to prioritize how we interact with our COTS products and our SaaS products in order to be able to better understand how those provide solutions and value for us? Is something that is a challenge and one that I haven't seen a lot of folks do well. So if you have experience with this being uh, productive, love to hear about it. The next thing we're going to talk about, and this is going to lead into our next section, is the target of what you are threat modeling. The reason that you're threat modeling can also be a thing that affects your priority. And it's important to be able to factor in that information as part of this. What do I mean by this? Uh, you saw in the overview that we were going to talk next about the relationship between the application, the threat, and the mitigation. And so let's dive into how these lenses affect it. Now, when we're talking about prioritization, if we're talking about prioritizing an application, we'll tend to ask a cer certain subset of questions. And these subset of questions can then choose how we prioritize which applications we have to threat model, especially in larger organizations. If our prioritization at a team level for how we're threat modeling is the same as the organization, then our application also should be able to map to the priorities of our organization. So the first question here is just, is your application your golden goose? Is this the thing that you should be focusing on? If not, prioritize a different application. When we're talking about potentially legacy systems, which I've had the I'm going to say good fortune of being exposed to. One of the limiting resources is how many people do you know who still know how to program in COBOL or know how to interact with legacy mainframe systems and create highly available systems? Is the limiting resource the technology by which you have knowledge of, in which case it's a drain, drain in multiple areas? These types of questions about the state of the application or any application can help drive this prioritization. I'd like to draw your attention to a theme that you're going to see on the next three slides here, which is logging and something that I've come to appreciate more, especially the more time I've spent threat modeling, which is when it comes to a world where data and visibility are the absolute pinnacle of what we're focusing on, and I, I know that's a contentious sentence, but when data and visibility are what we are focusing on, it's important to be able to identify the areas where you do not have visibility and uh, an underestimated area where for me, this in my technological experience uh, has only grown is the logging story. I would encourage us all to look at applications that do not have a good logging story behind it and prioritize those applications. As we move to a world of data lakes and security lakes, the ability to repudiate what is happening in our environments, repudiate what our application does, is going to drive the priority, especially as we move into more regulated environments, environments that deal more with personal information and uh, health information too. So uh, taking a step back, 
where we're talking about priority and how it affects threats versus mitigations. Your application should drive where you're looking for those threats and mitigations. And you should find a way to log what your application is doing in a way that is visible, not just to your developers, but to the rest of your organization so that data uh, is prioritized accordingly with the rest of the systems. So when you're threat modeling a system, you tend to get threats. What do you do when a threat is driving your threat model? I've had conversations with practitioners and again, shout out to the uh, threat mod con organizers because this question came up a lot. What do we do when we're in a state of reactive threat modeling? And reactive threat modeling here is something happens in our industry, something happens in a, a space that is closely related to us, or maybe it's the next big breach in which uh, Americans' data or other countries' data is exposed to uh, other actors who take advantage of it. The threat itself can change how we prioritize this. It can prioritize the or change the priority of the teams that are involved with that application. Again, is it the golden goose or is it the thing with the data we need to protect the most? But it also gives us an opportunity to pause and take a step back and ask if we actually really understand a threat. When we see a threat come through in our CTI fields or other th threat intelligence, one of the opportunities that we have is we no longer look at the application, we look at that threat to our organization. And we then start looking at the parallelism between all of the applications if we have to support. If we're in a smaller organization, and again, here's size affecting uh, our priority, we may only prioritize, uh, we, we may be able to prioritize all of our applications. But if we're in a large organization, we now have to say, you know, with the likelihood of this threat, with the fallout of this threat against our potential data, does this change the priority of how we do threat modeling, not just the threats we generate from it, but does it encourage us to light a fire under other groups um, to, to follow and lead and say, hey, this is what we're expecting. Again, this goes to the question of logging, and I bring it up again for repudiation as being a threat that I've come to appreciate. Do we know in our applications where this threat can pop up as an indicator of compromise throughout our organization? If a priority set is shared by an organization or if a team is able to make a good case for shifting in priorities, what are we doing to make sure that all the teams can benefit from that additional visibility rather than saying, oh, you have yet another feature request? And part of that comes from the prioritization aspect of this. So we've talked about priorities, we've talked about how threats and applications affect priorities, but to the topic here, threat versus mitigation, what and how to prioritize, there are times where we need to make our mitigations the priority of what we're threat modeling, as well as the priority of the organization. Uh, recently, I've had the, the good pleasure of working with a hardware security device and looking at some of the implementations of a pilot. And I'll, I'll admit, I was a naysayer before, but one of the things that opened my eyes to why this type of security feature uh, can be beneficial for especially certain types of organizations is because the mitigation itself becomes the priority. By adding this additional level of complexity, this additional level of security, tying it to things that are already well-regulated like FIDO, we gain this ability to bring visibility into the mitigation itself. And that mitigation can then drive other conversations about prioritization. So when we're talking about mitigations here, part of it, and I'm using my example here with the hardware security device, is do we understand the process and technology that we're trying to protect ourselves from? Part of this can be, do we know how to demonstrate that this mitigation is doing what we're expecting it to? That is oftentimes one of the things that I think falls by the wayside because we announce, oh yes, we've mitigated this threat, but in returning to the threat modeling manifesto's fourth question, did we do a good enough job? 
by prioritizing looking at mitigations and understanding mitigations, we have that opportunity to really drill down to that fourth question and not just have it be a yes or no, but be able to say, oh, we can prioritize these improvements because a mitigation is no longer technologically relevant or a mitigation is no longer fitting. And it allows us to uh, build more trust in our own system even if we're identifying things that we need to improve on, because we're saying that we understand the priority of fixing that. And prioritizing tech debt, which is something that we haven't talked about, but I'm sure we're all familiar with, is one of those silent killers when it comes to organizations and the ability to maintain their applications. So to recap for a little bit here, we talked about three different lenses that can affect prioritization within an organization and a team. We've established that prioritization is relative for teams and organization and that need to have those discussions frequently in order to be in a practice of understanding the same priorities. But once an organization and a team have aligned around priorities, how do you actually protect the organization um, and this priority concept as part of threat modeling? So. We had talked about two sets of things. The first one we're going to dive into is executive buy-in. Now, we're talking about threat modeling. Why executives? Executives are the mutual interrupt shield for the rest of the organization's priorities. They, in my humble opinion, should be the first line of defense from changes in scope rather than, in some cases, and I know this doesn't always apply, the originators of scope creep. This is really important when you especially look at how much adoption there is of tooling, and we're going to talk about tooling next here, but when an executive makes the decision to purchase or implement a, a product or contract with a vendor, the executive should also take on the responsibility of building that relationship in lieu of their team. So that way they understand the value of the purchase, but also how its implementation in the organization drives value from a data-driven proposition. The two other things that I would love to see more executives rise to as part of protecting the prioritization conversation is that one, they should be participating in prior in threat models of prior threats and providing their input as to how these threats either being mitigated in the past or being addressed now today can actually go through and improve their process and likewise gives them an opportunity to reassess things from prior threats and prior mitigations as a lens. The second thing that I wanted to point out here is that from an executive standpoint, there is a responsibility to understand the systems and the data that everyone maintains. When we looked at the three different lenses that can impact prioritization, in each of them, logging was a requirement because the logs then provide you your data. If you don't have data and metrics being output from your team, from your organization, and you don't have those mapped to priorities, then it's very difficult for people in a decision-making position to make good decisions that are data-driven. So here's one of those positive feedback loops that we can ask this question as part of our threat modeling. How are we seeing these different re lenses reflected in our data? How do we interact with our data in such a way where we can say, yes, at this point in time, we need to prioritize a threat-based way of threat modeling across our applications because it is relevant and affects our ability to protect data, which is our number one priority. These types of decisions, though, mean that there is a requirement from the development team, from the a requirement from the infrastructure teams and the other teams that report up to inform and educate and have those individuals participate in, in the mutual education of how the rest of these decisions that happen in a threat modeling event impact the rest of the organization and their priorities. When it comes to data, though, there is one thing that I'd like to point out, which is that tools can be great for generating information, but they can also create a lot of toil. Uh, during the threat modeling conference, there was a really great uh, presentation 
uh, by one of the attendees that I believe is here, where they walk through the process of comparing and contrasting three different threat modeling tools and how they went through and navigated the decision-making process is very valuable because it reflects the process by which they established priority and then how they adapted their priorities based off of the results that they found as well, too. I put a couple of uh, responses that people have given either for why they can't do threat modeling or why they can't implement some sort of tools in their pipeline. And at the end of the day, none of these sentiments are true. No tools can accurately uh, replace all of the functionality of manual threat modeling. But it's a little naive to believe that just threat modeling as an individual or as a group, as humans, can't be supplemented by the data. So to that end, a, a reminder for how we protect priority and how our tools need to affect priority. We should prioritize tooling, tuning our tools because by tuning our tools for our users, we as security professionals or developers gain the ability to understand how and why these tools are implemented. And then we also have the ability to plan for how we're going to use the data that comes out of this information. One of the other things that needs to be acknowledged and that, uh, as part of this prioritization conversation is that data is expanding at a rapid rate and more so than what a lot of humans are able to process at any given point in time. When we're looking at making data-driven conversations, it's important that we find and implement tools that allow us to correlate data across multiple data sources. One of the things that our SAS and DAS uh, tooling does as well as uh, general vulnerability scanners is they've now implemented things like the CS CVSS scoring, EPSS, and also have KEV lists. All of these are different lenses to look at potential indicators of compromise, but we're still not yet in a state where all of these different attributes can be easily cross-correlated. And so it's important to take the time to look at these systems and really educate ourselves, our organizations, and our executives. How can we use exploit probability scoring um, services like this to be able to understand how and why we should be prioritizing uh, different either threats, mitigations, or applications based off of these results? Last but not least, one of the things that bringing tooling data into threat modeling does is it runs the risk of potentially sending us down a rabbit hole, but it should be there to supplement what we already have. We shouldn't use threat modeling to try and validate why an application does or doesn't have certain uh, things showing up in a scanner, because at the end of the day, it's not a scanner that makes the decision for us as to whether or not our application is secure in a way that makes us feel comfortable. It's up to the humans that interact with that system every single day to be able to understand, again, what data they're generating and how they see it being implemented. So I've talked a lot. What is, uh, well, I have talked a lot, but I'd like to hear from you. Uh, we've talked about how organizations define priority. We talked about how the process of prioritization generally focuses on three things, limited resource, knowledge, and the target of who benefits. There's different drivers, the protecting value, data, or meeting regulation and experimenting. When we're talking about different targets, these lenses of threat modeling and prioritization, we have our application, we have the threats, we have the mitigation, each of them generating their own changes in priority and questions. We have the impacts of uh, how priority can change depending on it attributes of the organization, things that may be specific to the organization rather than some of the general recommendations. And then we talked about how to pri protect priority and then implement that protected priority in how we approach threat modeling, both with tools and manually. That in mind, if folks want to go through and take a screen cap of this, I'm more than happy to leave it up. 
but uh, I hope that as we've exited this, it's not a versus conversation between threats and mitigations, instead a conversation of how, by understanding what we're trying to target as our threat models and tying it back to our overall priorities, we can adapt as we need to and hopefully make the process of threat modeling more enjoyable and more focused for the people who participate in it. That in mind, Josh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our discussion questions.